Dude, I'm fucking producing this movie right now. Holy shit. <laughs> I guess we'll do it that way. Episode 34. It's, it's it's insane how much shit is going on right now, John. Give me the latest. What's going on? Oh my gosh. Okay, so first though, you were saying you went to Tony's. I, yeah, I gotta I gotta say I was never a big big fan of Tony's. Okay, I haven't been in years, absolutely years. Tony's little pasta place here. Kind of like it's you know before the big food scene in Chattanooga took off. Tony's was like one of the spots. Yeah, it was one of the better, quote-unquote, better restaurants like 10 years ago. Did it impress and, or disappoint? Um, it was fine. I mean, yeah, that was you know, experience. they broke some plates. and Oh, boy. You know, it was it was On fine. your head? They just smashed them over no, your head? Like no, that Chris Farley no. sketch? Have you seen that where it's like the, the fake coffee? Right. And they're like, you've been drinking instant coffee. <laughs> and then he, he's like... I'm living a lie! And he, like, <laughs> smashes plates and, like, kills someone in the kitchen. It's pretty great. Did you ever see the uh, colon blow episode where Phil Hartman is, um, he's, like, in a suit sitting there at a breakfast table, and he's, like, about to chomp into a bowl of, uh, like, Raisin Bran or something? <laughs> and a voiceover comes over, and it's like, you know, you'd have to eat five bowls of Raisin Bran to equal. And it's just the numbers just keep getting more preposterous. And by the end of it, it's like, you'd have to eat 8,000 bowls of your normal cereal. <laughs> to do Pretty what? It compared to what? To, to, to Compared to colon blow. <laughs> <laughs> That's the which name of the product, <laughs> which was the name of the <laughs> Phil Hartman cereal, Colin Blow. That's incredible. Dude, I've talked about I missed before, that when you first said Colin Blow, so I'm about to stick in my head. Oh my god! <laughs> my all-time favorite <laughs> SNL fake commercial <laughs> of of absolute all time yeah. is this is this commercial. It starts is like probably some sometime in the 2000s, early 2000s, when the internet was just taking off. And it starts, and it's very businessy. You know, it's like these guys in suits standing in front of their nice houses talking about planning for the future. And, like, I only trust experts with my mm -hmm. money. And when it comes to real estate and divestiture, I only go to the pros. And <laughs> the end of it, it's like, you know, call Mortimer and Saul for all your financial needs or reach us now on the web at www.clownpenis.fart. <laughs> 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 that's the that's the whole joke. That's the whole joke because <laughs> they say that no, <laughs> that all the other they, they say you're so, like, where is this going? <laughs> the last the last line of the whole episode is like, or the skit. Like, oh my uh, gosh! I'm and now all the resources of America's oldest investment firm are available online. Dylan Edwards on the internet at www.clownpenis.fart. A lot of investment companies rushed onto the internet, but Dylan Edwards took their time. Sure, when they were ready, there was only one web address left, but it's one you can count on. That is genius. Uh, my favorite, yeah. I think, is... um. Oh, no, what's, uh, what's that Chris Farley, Adam Sandler sketch where they're house-sitting? <laughs> it's a commercial. It's these two dudes who show up at this guy's house and he's like house sitting and it's like a super big dump. And yeah. then they like pull out a, pa a, a pack of Schmitz gay. And then, they, oh. <laughs> and then the pool like fills up and it's just full of beautiful gay men. And yeah. the two guys are just like, Oh my gosh. And it's like a classic beer right. ad. Oh, it's really funny. Anyway. Wow. Dude, that is, you're right though. That sounds that Phil Hartman one. I mean, the, uh, the, the clown penis dot fart. For mutual funds. Clown penis dot fart. Online broker. Clown penis dot fart. Retirement and tuition planning. Clown penis dot fart. The people you trust. <laughs> at clown penis dot fart. They nailed that. I mean, oh, it's so good. Anyway, how's, uh, how's rollers going? Well, I got fired. I made some, uh, very you, inappropriate you fart jokes. <laughs> Tara was like, you're done. You're done. Um, oh, dude, so many things. Okay, um, I'm going to blow through them, and then you can tell me what you're interested in. How about that? Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tara's in town. Who? Uh, she, Tara, our producer, is in town. Tara oh. was going to join us on the show today, 
I was like, she she didn't really want to do it. She said she likes being the phantom of a movie, not like the front, you know? And so uh-huh. I was like, well, you still got to come on at some point. She was like, okay, I'll do 10 minutes. And now she's gone. I can't even find her. <laughs> okay, well. So we'll have to do another one. Uh, but real quick, so Tara's in town. She's staying in the apartment behind my house. So okay. she's, it's, which is great because we can just like yeah. meet up easily, get some stuff done. Tara, you wait. <clears throat> Tara! No, she's gone, man. I'm telling you. She, I, I, uh, I knocked on the wall earlier and I got no answer. Um, did, did you do that? Dude, I was in an apartment in New York one time where the neighbor below us actually did the old broom on the ceiling trick to tell us that we were being too noisy. Awesome. That's one of my favorite jokes. Speaking of SNL is uh, Black Jeopardy. When um, <laughs> the ending, he always comes up with another reason to 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 end the show. And on one, he's like, <laughs> he's like, well, the sound of the broom knocking on the floor is our sign that it's our final clue. <laughs> it was really funny. Uh, anyway, uh, what else? Okay, so Tara's in town. We are just cranking, which is great. What's the coolest thing you guys have done together? Dude, we went antiquing yesterday. How old is Tara? <laughs> She's, I'm not 100% I'm sure, saying, but I, at least, like, yeah, over 50, I guess. She'd have to be to enjoy antiquing. That makes me over 50 as well. I'm pretty sure. Okay. No, we went antiquing. We found like, oh, dude, we were looking at all sorts of stuff. I found a bunch of photo albums of um, like people from the 40s in South Pasadena, which is where we live. So I might oh, go wow. back and buy a couple of those. It's kind of cool, like looking through all their pictures and scrapbooks yeah. and stuff. Um, what it else? Makes you realize how insignificant your own life is. Oh, I know. No, I mean, it fit. It very much fit in this whole theme we've been talking about. Um what else? Uh, oh, dude, this is huge. I sent you some photos, did I not? Yeah, you did some polar, some <laughs> some snaps of uh, Polaroids. I sent you Polaroids of our cast right. hanging out at my house. So we have a full cast minus a couple smaller roles as of yesterday. Like yesterday morning was basically when we finalized the cast, and then somehow we we managed to get them all over my house to just hang out and have dinner last night. We had some tacos, which was just really surreal, like having yeah. the four leads of the movie in my house talking to right. each other, hanging out. I was like, whoa, this is happening. This thing is real. Did you learn anything? I mean, did you... In the sense that you're like, ooh, I'm going to have to change this, or... I didn't have to change anything. I played them some music from the movie, like some original music that's being worked on. Um, great, great feedback on that, and people were really digging it. I mean, we honestly just kind of hung out. We were talking about everything, you know, costumes. We were talking about hair, because, you know, people are going to get their hair done. You know, those Polaroids that I took, John, those are actually for the movie. Yeah. Because, you know, these people have known each other for a long time, and so I kind of have to create that illusion. Um, oh man. Yeah. It was just, it was just great. We just had a really great time. Everybody's really chill, which, you know, Tara and I were kind of debriefing after and we were saying, it's just not always the case that people are, it's rare that they're available at all this early, you know what I mean? To just hang out and do stuff. It's even more rare that they're kind of chill and just are like, yeah, I'll come to your house and hang out. So I'm feeling really thankful that that's a possibility. Um, so yeah, man. are they all local? I mean, I know Tara's not, but yeah, all the cast are local. Yeah, so two of them actually live. One, there's a husband and a wife. I won't give names yet um, because I think we want to announce all the cast sort of when we start production, um, and that's a little bit of like a PR move that Tara's been working on. Um, and but so we'll talk more about PR. But basically, there the idea is that we want to we want to make a little bit of an announcement out of it if if possible. But um. Yeah, so I won't say names, but uh, Donnie and Jane are two of the leads. Um, they are being – Donnie and Jane, the, the two people playing those roles are actually married to each other and live uh, about a mile from the venue, which is nuts. Wow. So that worked out. Work. I know. It's cool. And then uh, Maddie and Rufus are both L.A.-based. So, um, yeah, anyway. So that's happening. Um I'm trying to think. I mean, dude, we're just racing towards production. What else? Tara and I have just been driving around. You might not want to people. answer this, but um, <clears throat> I've got to ask. Yeah. What's the, what was the most actory thing that you heard? 
Like, don't give any, don't blow anybody up here. But like, did anybody don't talk about me, their bro. chakra? Did anybody talk about their energy? I did, did a chakra talk- flow the other day, actually. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> what's something that you heard where somebody was like, "For me, I just feel like with my uh, with my energies right now, I need to explore." Dot dot dot. What'd you hear? I gotta say, everybody is super normal human being person. Okay. So far. All right. I I don't don't get me wrong. I was waiting for that moment to happen. But, but it seems like everybody's a little You're down <clears throat> for a little uh woo woo not woo woo in a bad way, Mysticism. but like you, Yeah, you're down for a little for a little whatever, right? Hell yeah. I love that stuff. Yeah. I meditate. If somebody's I do yoga. Okay. No, I yeah, I, so I uh you. What, you know, we what, no, nothing would shock me. We'll get there. You know, we we all got to get to know each other a little bit. I'm sure they got mm-hmm. some you know, rose quartz, uh, just sitting. Well, I have some on my desk. <laughs> it's turning out to <laughs> we're, be you. We're, it is me. Did I actually might show be up? the woo woo guy for sure. <laughs> Did anybody show up in character? Um, no, <laughs> no, that but that would be, would be hilarious. That would be extreme. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, that would be, very strange um, what's the vibe was, was everybody sort of on their best behavior were people like if i were i would be tempted to walk in that room and introduce myself like let's say i was going to be donnie mm-hmm. i would be part of me would be tempted to walk in and be like hey i'm donnie and make a joke as if i were coming in being a method actor i you think know? everybody was kind of feeling each other loose? out to some extent yeah i think like every no but i think we were all everybody was loose i mean you know it's always like slightly awkward to meet new people ever and no one there knew each other except for um donnie and jane and so i hadn't even met two of the people before last night you know we had phone calls but that was it um and so yeah I, you know it started off like any dinner party kind of can tend to start off which is like it's a little slow, but then again, you know, everybody's outgoing. One thing, you know, I'm, I'm remembering though, is I always think of actors as their characters and I'm always, this continues to happen to me. I'm always still like, Oh yeah, you're an actor, right? Not the character you're playing. And it always takes like 15 seconds. And then I'm kind of like, okay, cool. And I readjust, but there are always times where I'm like, especially just people who I've seen on screen more than I've seen in person, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh but yeah, anyway. totally. I mean, I haven't really met any famous people, but yeah, that's that's always you what will, you John. hear, like on podcasts and stuff. Like, yeah, this is just some ding dong, like me, right? Yeah, totally. But and I, I, yeah, no, and I, I think hopefully we'll have all the cast on at some point. You know, let's talk a little bit, John, about yeah, uh, the next month and a half. You know, because oh, no, 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 no. I think here's what I think, John. I think that we should start preparing our very sensitive, very fickle audience for what probably needs to happen at some point in the next several months, which is uh, sort of a season break. Um, you know, maybe two to three weeks where we don't publish an episode. Call it a hiatus. Call it a hiatus. Don't call me Shirley, though. Um, <laughs> don't call me late for dinner. Don't. <laughs> But I don't know what you think of that. I mean, maybe it's not necessary. One thing we could do, John, is if we plan ahead enough, we could schedule some additional episodes to come out. They just won't be as time sensitive. That's another possibility. But I, here's the reason. I think I'm frankly going to need a little bit of a mental break, I think, right after Rollers. Mm. Um, we are coming up on... Is this episode 34? That's how old I am, 34. Oh. One for every year of your life. I don't know. So I was thinking... Maybe we go to 40, you know, we go to 40 and take a little midlife hiatus or we could potentially get all the way to 50 because another thing I was thinking, John, is that during production, that would be a fun time to try to interview different people involved with the project. Right. Totally. Um, And those don't necessarily need to be super time sensitive. So maybe what we should do, John, is we should keep the live updates coming until maybe a week after we shoot mm-hmm. rap production, which will basically be mean all of you lovely listeners get an episode, fresh episodes, like fresh meaning time sensitive, 
like we currently do. You know, we record a couple days before the episode comes out, that kind of thing, until, you know, March, early March. But in the meantime, John, we're recording those interviews. Ooh. And then we can release those over the course of a month or two while I'm kind of editing the show or editing the movie. You know, there's not going to be quite as many exciting updates. Or or we could, because I just think it would be a bummer to take a hiatus during production because that's going to be some of the hot, hottest some of the hottest goods, some of the hottest materials. Right, oh, for sure. We all want to hear your, like, cur- your crisis, because mm-hmm. there's going to be one where oh, you're like, fuck yeah. this, I can't do it. Yeah, no, that's going to happen. Or something, right? No, totally. And, you know, I hope, uh, I w- yeah, I want, John, I want you to be there when this thing crashes and burns. <laughs> I'll be sitting in Chattanooga, I'm looking out my window, my neighbors are barbecuing. Mm-hmm. They've got, they don't have a care in the world. In February? Dude, it's 65 degrees here. Wow. They, my neighbors, I found out, moved here from California. Oh. Not Los Angeles, but they moved here from California. What were they thinking? I'm not sure, but they're out there barbecuing right now. What's up, guys? <laughs> Tell them One I time they were having a party. My, na- <laughs> my neighbors, we're out on our back deck. Mm-hmm. We have like elevated back decks. and Your, they, your they, pencil back deck, your toothpick exactly. supported back deck. I Rickety. cannot believe that thing has not fallen over yet. It's been up for hundreds of years. It's fine. It's but hideous. I, flew, I got a drone with like that you could, you know, it's got a camera on and stuff. And right. I flew it over because they were, <laughs> I didn't realize this, but they were having like a fancy clothes party over at their house. Mm-hmm. And I flew my drone over and it crashed. Wait, by into fancy their clothes deck. party, do you mean <clears throat> they were wearing tuxedos? Oh, not like naked. No, no, no. They were I wearing took... like Okay. It was like a great Gatsby theme party, that kind of deal. Uh-huh. And I flew and crashed the drone over there. So I had to like climb over the fence. And as I'm climbing over the fence, I look up and I see all these people in tuxedos like staring down at me mm-hmm. as I'm crawling through their brambles, you know, to get my drone. That's so creepy. What else is going on, John? Lots lots of music progress. Last night, we were listening to this one song of this band that I really want to get for the movie. And yeah. I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but... The manager of said band, you know, I won't say which band it is, but the the manager of said band, the band is interested. We've talked to them, but he just kind of went radio silent. We're like, yo, what's up, dog? And um, I finally, you know, because we're running out of time, we got to schedule this thing. I reached out to the band directly on Instagram. No way that works. Does that, did it work? It did work. No. I got this morning an email from the guy who has been not responding. And then I also mm-hmm. got... Uh, a message back on Instagram from the band saying, call me or give me a call. So it did actually work. And I think there, uh, I I heard, you know, the manager was saying there was some sort of crisis. So, you know, I I figured there was a good reason. I just wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. You you want, you want people, you you got, you got to fight for what you want. You got to, you got to fight for your, for your, John, uh, <laughs> what else has been going on? Well, that's a good message, man. You know, I was waiting in the car the today. We, we took like a walk or whatever, and then we head back to the car. Was it a walk said, or was it whatever? It was a, it was a walk, bike ride. It was all of the above. Mm-hmm. And uh, I happened to like, you know, if you look at the Explore page on Instagram and you're scrolling through, right. I got stuck in this loop of like motivational business speakers oh. who I do not follow. I oh. have zero interest in. But these guys are like, if you don't own real estate in 2019, you're an idiot. You know, like guys <clears> screaming <throat> at you yep. like, if you want to be a millionaire by the time you're 36, you got to follow these steps. Ay, ay, ay. And, uh, but they, one of the clips on there, you know, I'm just scroll, scroll, scrolling through these. And, um, one of them was Steve Jobs commencement speech tucked in between all these. And he's like, I, I realized when I was like 30 that I had to live every single day. Like it could be my last on earth and nothing really mattered because someday I'd be dead. So I don't have to be embarrassed about what people think about what I'm doing because I have, if, if it were my last day on earth, I wouldn't care what people thought mm. I would do whatever I wanted to. Right. So he's like, that's when it was a pivotal moment in my life, and now I live exactly like that, and that's how I've been successful. I actually really like that message. Yeah, I mean, it's maybe a little narcissistic. Like, he supposedly had an entire, not an entire, but a daughter that he treated terribly. No, that's true. I guess I just mean maybe a healthier version of that, though. I like I like the idea that you shouldn't live your life based on what people think of you. That I think that plus nihilistic, like, there is no morality like there's no right and wrong those are that's a weird combo to me that would be a tough i don't sure. I, I think he was kind of like was he a buddhist i can't remember he was not a whatever yeah. yeah but i think like 
you know, so I think having absolutely no sort of compass, like society doesn't matter and there's no higher power slash morality slash ethics. And that could get real hairy, you know, but I like the idea that if you have some sort of guiding compass, that that is the thing that you measure yourself against instead of other people thinking that you are a certain way. So John, one thing that I've been really surprised by our last episode, I was saying that I felt really good, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now at this very moment, I feel terrific. Okay. Oh, yeah. Unexpected. Okay. But for the last like four days, I have kind of been waffling wildly vacillating sort of vacillate. Is that going back and forth between feeling really great, starting to freak out. Which has been really interesting because I can't quite figure out where the freak out is coming from. What do you mean freak out? Like uh, things are going to go wrong. I can't manage this. This isn't going to be good or or what? I mean, that's uh, that's the list of stuff I would be freaking out about. No, it's it's less like logistics and more. I don't know. I, I, I think I did start to kind of re-ask the question like, why am I doing this? Why add another piece of garbage to the ever-growing pile of garbage (laughs) why waste all these people's time just see it in theaters october 4th exactly like why that's what i started thinking i was like what am i doing like there's already enough shit i don't even like watching movies right now like Mm. why am i doing this that's what i was thinking when i was laying in bed i was thinking why the f Am I putting myself through this? Because, I, I mean, I feel like, I mean, I'm exhausted. You know, I'm thrilled about the way the work is going, but I am, right. I feel not to minimize or say that I have any knowledge whatsoever of what childbirth is like, but as a metaphor, I do feel like there's this thing that is inside of me and I'm trying to sort of bring it into the world as 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 uh, safely and and sort of as as seamlessly as possible and I just feel like it's it's coming out but it's kind of like ripping me open a little bit you know what I mean like not to be too graphic it's like it's costing me sure. something to make this movie you know I just got a text from my wife that said tell Zay he has no idea what he's talking about <laughs> <laughs> just I'll pretend I'm like okay fine then let's say it's not it's not childbirth. I'm birthing the alien from alien. There you go. Okay. That's a metaphor. It feels a little understand. bit like that. It's like like what is it doing? You know, and all of a sudden this little thing pops out of me and it kills me. Mm. You know, but then I, but then John, you know, a few hours later I may be feeling like I'm on top of the world. For instance, the one movie I've watched in a while. I tried to watch another movie and I was like this sucks. I don't want to watch this shit. Um, and it was fine. I just wasn't in the mood for it. Citizen Kane. And then I watched Inherent Vice, which I texted you about. Oh yeah. Thomas Pynchon. Oh, so good. I didn't realize Pynchon has been writing novels like in the last two decades. I kind of thought he was a dude from the seventies. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's been writing, I think since the sixties. Oh wow. Okay. But Inherent Vice is, is 2009, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's been, well, you know, he's an interesting guy because he's, Nobody really knows who. I mean, they know yeah, his name. Yeah, he's very reclusive, about right? It. Yeah, he's virtually unknown. I mean, there's like one or two pictures of him that exist, and he his voice appeared in The Simpsons, and apparently he appeared in the movie Inherent Vice. But I have, I, but no one knows who. I never bothered to check uh, after I saw the movie because I, I like him. I mean, I like that idea of him, and it's like leave him alone, you know? Yeah. Let him do his thing. Yeah, I mean, if he doesn't want to be known, he shouldn't be known, you know. True, but he was in the movie, apparently, so. So he's effing with everybody. Although that could can be completely hype, right? Like, if I made that movie, I would absolutely leak that he was in it to make a bunch of nerds go watch it, even if he wasn't in it. Totally. So what I was going to say, though, is I watched Inherent Vice, and it made me really excited to make a movie, which is great. Mm. It, it just... Okay. Man, it just worked on every level, and I it got kind of mixed reviews because I think a lot of people are like, what's the movie about? It's like really, I mean, it's barely, barely fits the definition of a movie plot, you know? I mean, it's very loosey-goosey, sort of shaggy dog, like not really going anywhere, similar to Big Lebowski or something. You know, it's it's a play on a noir. It's a comedy, which I didn't realize before. Some people told me I should check it out again. But it's basically this, inco- you know, jo- Joaquin Phoenix playing this incompetent private detective and 
he's a he's always high and he never knows what's going on and the way they capture these scenes mm-hmm. just the feeling of the chaos in Los Angeles at that point because you know it was like right at, it was 1970 you know like right after kind of the summer of love turned into a bunch of murders and everybody was like oh maybe drugs are bad for you and you know maybe free love is complicated and all that kind of stuff you know LA was in a weird place and he's just stoned out of his gourd but man there were some scenes that just were just weirdly transcendent they kind of were i don't know i don't know i don't even want to try to describe them but i i really recommend an inherent vice watch yeah i watched it twice years ago and at first i watched it i had no clue what was going on i watched it the second time and i picked up the plot you know because there is like a there is a weaving mm-hmm. plot through it. And yeah, it's great, dude. It's a, it's a good movie. Well, I think, though, uh, I enjoyed it in part because I wasn't even really trying to keep up with the plot. I was, like, sort of kind of doing it, but I was mostly just watching it as if I was... Just kind of letting it wash over you. Because he's barely trying to figure out the plot. Right. Joaquin Phoenix is barely trying to solve this mystery. He's mostly just kind of wandering around the city stoned. You know? Right. And they, they do a great job conveying that. I mean... Dude, when he's talking to that old guy in that club, Mm-hmm. And he, I don't know if you remember, but there's this incredible scene where he's trying to kind of talk to this old guy who's trying to put him in his place. And he kind of comes back at him with this retort that goes absolutely nowhere, you know, because he's just completely baked and just way out of his depth in terms of this argument that he's having. But he kind of thinks he wins it. It's, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I got to watch it again. I haven't seen it in a while. Well, I mean, you know, I'm glad you haven't seen it in a long time because if you remembered it well, it would not be eligible for discussion on the show. That is so true. Um, it was it was 2014 though. By the way, yawn. Oh really? Yeah. Hmm. Um, one thing they did really Anderson? well. There's this PT Anderson. Hmm. There's another. There's this one really long scene with. Is it Elizabeth Wright? Oh, is her I have name, no clue. Maybe let me check. I know Martin Short's in it. Yeah. Oh, he's really good. Um, oh, Owen Wilson's in it. I forgot. Oh, Catherine Watterson is her name. Not Elizabeth Wright. Catherine Watterson. Who does she play? She plays Shasta, kind of the, the femme fatale, basically, yeah. that's like, yeah. <clears throat> well, she's not I really a femme fatale, but like she she kind of is filling that role to some extent, you know? I always remember the scene where he runs into, Joaquin Phoenix runs into her later, and she has new teeth. And she says something to him like, uh, yeah, I got new chompers. The heroin mm-hmm. sucks you like my all chompers? Yeah, you like my chompers. I don't know dude. why that line always pops into my head. Oh, it's so creepy, dude. That dentist, oh my gosh. But anyway, yeah, because everybody's doing heroin. Oh, and he captured just the feeling that, I don't know, just like the feeling of being kind of out of control, whether you're drunk or high or whatever, you know, just that yeah. feeling of all of, I thought that was great. Anyway, Catherine Watterson has this one scene with Joaquin Phoenix that is very long, but it kind of fits the thing I've been talking about, which is like you, I didn't even realize that it was one long take until it was almost over. And I was like, wait, I don't think we've cut yet. And it just worked so beautifully, partly because he doesn't cut around he forces you to sort of just be in this moment in a really intense moment that's like you almost kind of want to look away from, but you kind of can't because he's not chopping around. So you just feel like you're spying on this very intimate, weird moment between them. Mm. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty explicit, but like totally, I don't know. It was really powerful the way he did it. Um, there There were a lot of scenes like that that I just felt like he just – totally kind of figured out the best he just exploited the tools you know to his advantage to 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 his advantage for the movie anyway long movie two and a half hours but i i really highly recommend it if you got some time anyway so john i was saying though i i keep going back and forth between these different things um yeah because i am excited to make the movie but i'm also i don't know i i'm not even like nervous that it might be bad because at this point, I'm actually starting to think it could be good. It's more, I don't know. I think it's kind of the same problem I was having back when I was like uh, thinking about making the movie bigger, for example. You mm-hmm. know, I think it's this, I, I'm starting to think it's this self conscious push to, um, I don't want to say sabotage the movie, but 
to uh, to suck the fun out of it you know like i start raising the bar or or, or moving the goal post ahead because hmm. the you know there's something i i haven't figured this out yet but i have this obsessive sort of obsessive compulsive tendency to try to make things not fun and to not enjoy them you know it's sort of like i'm allowed to get this nice thing or have this great privilege to direct this movie and kind of follow my dreams but since everyone else doesn't get to follow their dreams i should probably not enjoy this so that i can kind of commiserate with everyone else you know Uh, is that does that make any sense i'm not saying it makes sense it makes sense it's crazy though no it is i'm not saying it makes sense i guess i'm all right in what ways know. do you do this? How does it manifest itself? Well, I'm laying in bed and I'm thinking, why would I add more garbage to the giant heap of garbage? You know, because in my mind I started turning. So I think what's been happening over the last week is that I've started turning this whole thing into kind of this quest for transcendent art or something, you know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and that is not. It's not realistic, not because it's impossible, but because you don't ever set out really with that goal. You know, you set out with the goal of doing something really, really well and and creating something very carefully and thoughtfully. But I don't need to set the bar of success at classic. Right, you know? right, right. But I keep finding myself wanting to do that. Because I keep finding myself thinking, you know, this actually might be like a, a movie that people want to watch. You know, not that it's going to be the best movie ever, but like I just keep liking it more, you know, and I keep thinking maybe maybe this movie won't be a, a another piece of garbage to throw on top of the garbage heap. But then I can't be satisfied with that, you know, so I immediately start thinking, well, the only way that it won't be a piece of garbage to add to the garbage heap is not by being good or not even be it by being a really great little piece, but by being a true sort of cult classic. And I'm like, that's just so absurd to set the bar at that. That makes absolutely no sense. And yet I keep doing it subconsciously, not even subconsciously. I keep doing it consciously. Think about what that means too, in a way is um, a cult classic almost always is not successful when it originally comes out, you know, it takes years, decades, sometimes, and I don't know if you actually want that. I mean, a lot of those were like originally bombs, you know? Oh, well, thankfully the movie's small enough that I'm not worried about it on a financial level. You know, like I, I actually mm-hmm. really believe that if we make a movie at the level that I think we can make it at realistically, based on the way things are going, that we will be okay financially. Mm-hmm. But it's not, no matter how well it does financially, it's not going to make it worth it on a purely financial level it's just that's not the point of the movie you know the point of the movie is to like make a little bit of a return for our investors but no one's going to get paid totally what they're worth in the same way that they would if it was a bigger movie but that's not why anyone's doing it which means that adds pressure for me self-imposed this has got to be worth it this has got to be worth it and the way it's going to be worth it is by being critically appreciated by someone and I just can't control that. But I wish I could. You know, I, I keep trying to, I think. <laughs> that's the problem. I think that's what changes when I'm laying in bed. I'm like, I don't want to do this if I don't have a guarantee that it's going to be worth it. And I'm kind of like, yeah, that's why most people don't do this, I guess. So. Okay. When I was a kid, I ran, when I was a junior, I was always involved in student council. <clears throat> so I, I ran for student council president my last year, but I went to the principal. I was running against one girl and I went to the guy who, who was a student council like advisor. And I was like, I'm going to, I want to run for student council president. Mm-hmm. What do you think my chances are of winning? I was like, I just want to know what you think my chances are. Is it like, mm-hmm. you think it's like 75%? And he was like, I, I don't know. And I was like, honestly, if it's not like at least 70, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> And he looked at me and was like, you're an absolute idiot. He was yeah, that's pissed. not how this works. It was just an absolutely stupid attitude. And I ended up running and winning, obliterating the girl. And just really? doing, yeah, I did a terrible job, though. I mean, not I didn't do a terrible job. I just, I could have done more. Like, that girl who was 
who she would have really against, taken it seriously. She would have taken it seriously. Like I did a competent job, but like she was, you know, she was a girl. She was way more mature. Why did you obliterate her? Because you're a dude. <laughs> I went in there and gave a rip roaring speech, dude. I like I was quoting stuff. I was oh, wow. working everybody up into the in the crowd into a lather. Oh wow, it lather them up. I was lathering them up. Dude. I love when you get people lathered up, John. But I'm such a wimp. I mean, I was such a John, wimp. John, give at the us time. a taste of that speech right now. Oh, my gosh, dude. I, I can't. I can't. Can't be satisfied. Try to worry me, baby, but I never get to be myself. People worry, baby. I have a seven-year-old son and a ten-year-old son, and we were at Wendy's the other day. Real dum dums. And we're, we're sitting at the uh, me and my son, me, uh, me and my son, my older son are sitting there, and I was like, "Yo, where's uh, where's Junior, the little one?" And he's like, he kind of shrugs and points up to the counter. We're at Wendy's, and I look over, and Junior is getting a frosty for himself, you know, and like he just. <laughs> He doesn't have money. He didn't ask me. <laughs> he just is walking away from the counter with a frosty, and the oh, women behind the counter—he has a frosty. He's, he already has it, and the women oh, behind the counter wow. are like smiling and like waving to him. And I was like, "Dude, what? Where'd you get that from?" And he and he said, "I asked for it," and she said, "I was cute," and she gave it to me. And I was like, "You didn't have any money? <laughs> no way! <laughs> yeah." <gasps> That is so he great. He straight up went up there and charmed a frosty right out wow. of him. Wow. You know, that's a that sounds like it could be a bit <laughs> that could be a disaster waiting to happen when uh-huh. he's 16 and can get li- you know, he like convinces, you know, somebody to like give him beer or, you know, the things that 16-year-olds would probably he'd be really good at that. But man, that's a great life skill. You know, yeah, I not guess being so. afraid to ask for things mm-hmm. and then doing it. And getting what you, I mean, that's one thing. He's you know, gonna make Tara, a great panhandler. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's one thing. Uh, Tara, my producer, is amazing at is like yeah. I just watch her. She just, especially if she, yeah, she just has a way of getting what she wants, which sounds terrible, like in a selfish way. But she does it. Part of the reason she's able to do it is because she isn't sort of pathologically selfish. She just knows. Like with this Pressure movie, points. she's like, everyone will want this to be good and they will be glad that they did it. So I just have to figure out how to get them involved. And, you know, sometimes that just takes figuring out what's going to work and mm. asking for what seems like an absurdly generous sort of amount of time or, or whatever. But then you'd be surprised. Like sometimes people just, if they believe in something, they want to do it. In this case, it's clear that they believed in how cute your son is, you know? Mm, yeah. And so they were like, yeah, I'll give you Frosty. Whatever. Sold. Yeah. Anyway. Um, well, John, we're coming to the end of our time here. How long does Tara stay for? She's here until the end of February. What? She's going to be in that apartment back there till f- the end of February? Two months. Holy crap. Yeah, dude. I'm telling you, this is wild. Movies are weird. It's a weird thing. How many people strange. are back there? Just her for now. Wow. Yeah, and then we and we've got another house in Highland Park that a couple people are staying in as well. And does she um, have access to like a fridge or does she have to come mm-hmm. into your house? No, there's an apartment. Yeah, oh, we, okay. we we have our own. Yeah, it's like a full mother-in-law suite. So it's like there's a fridge, there's bathroom, you know, its own entrance. Um so she's pretty comfortable. Okay, so Monday, tomorrow's Monday. What what do you guys do? Tomorrow, we've got a couple meetings. Here, let me pull up my calendar. Okay. Um, tomorrow. Man, actually tomorrow's really busy. We've got to do two contracts uh with some talent. Um, we've got a meeting with our first assistant director, Theo, in the morning at 10. Oh, that's a wild story. Oh man. Okay. I'm uh that is gonna be a fun one to tell how I met Theo. Um he's our first assistant director. Then at then we have a meeting with our production designer. Um uh I think at twelve or twelve thirty. And then we have a one thirty meeting in Beverly Hills with our 
with one of our executive producers, Tiffany. And then we have another meeting at three about a location that we're trying to lock down. So pretty packed. What are the chances that you're going to shoot some of it in your house? 100% as of a week ago. <laughs> we we needed a house, and I, was, I wasn't I was even thinking about ours, and Tara was looking at it, and we were like, where are we going to get this house? And she was like, actually, this is perfect for that one scene. So we're doing one scene here. I knew it. I knew it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Are you also? I figured out Alfred I'm going to be in the movie too, John. Cameo. Oh, bingo! Yeah, but I'm in a real scene. I gave myself a scene. Scene. I'm actually really psyched about it. It's going to be. Oh fun my one. goodness! Tell me. Uh huh. Um. Well, you remember the? I'll, I'm going to say the Wonkies, which will mean something uh-huh. to you, not everybody else. Their manager. Yeah. Mm. You know what scene I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think I'd actually be good for the role. And I have an idea of kind of how to play it. That's going to be really fun. So I'm I'm doing it because I want to. You know, I want to be in it. There's like f- how many lines? Like maybe five, six lines. Mm, it's like a full minute and minute long scene. So maybe fifteen lines. Fifteen lines. Okay. Yeah. Um. Maybe maybe twelve. I don't know. I'll count. It's enough. It's enough to like. You know. It's it's a real speaking role. Are you going to um, audition for the other producers? No. Tara already gave me the thumbs up. She she gave you the thumbs up. Yeah. All right. She was like, you, you can do it. You know why she gonna, said that though? Because I don't have to get paid. Right. I was going to say, do you do it for scale or? I actually, I'm trying to remember if I have to get paid because of SAG or oh, either way. It go. just goes back into the movie. It doesn't matter. But um, yeah, so we're doing that. Uh, dude, it's been, man, I'm just, lots going on. I mean, the big thing is, yeah, it's, it's really, really, really starting to ramp up. I mean, right now I'm definitely getting into there's so many things to do, not like there's some things to do. There's yeah. a, there's a lot of things to do. And now I'm getting to the point where I have to sort of do triage, you know, like, like I really owe everybody a, a semi final version of the script, but there's also people who sort of haven't gotten started yet. You know, I kind of have to orient people. What's your and, um, you know time what I'm frame and, on the script? When do you have to give a final script? Do you think I want to have it, mostly done i want to i want to have it out to people have a new pass out to people uh by like wednesday of this week so like the day after this episode's coming out um and you know it'll it'll change a little bit after that but i I want it to be in a really good place at that point but you know i'm I'm glad i've been percolating on it because i've actually had several ideas that i'm very excited about um but i I gotta do yeah i gotta do do some more work on it so we're our first ad is making a schedule right now so she needs some clarification um, anyway, yep. It's coming together though. Okay. Uh, I'm really psyched. Thanks for talking. Great. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk one day. Well, maybe, maybe <laughs> we'll, a week from now. We'll catch up soon. Okay. See ya. Talk to you. Bye. Robot credits produced by uncle Zay Smallman. Edited by the laziest, most procrastination team gust idiot me. Opening song window looker remix by FX Twin. Interstitial song lemon song by Led Zeppelin. Closing song lady don't techno by La Tyrex. Cover art Nagi or Dono. This has been a Mamma Bear production. Carries herself like the cutest, most courteous thing you've seen this side of the bay. Go about her business so purposeful that she got raised a sharp quick and she just won't quit. Uh-huh. Flaunting it, body built like a house made out of brick. She got the smile, the style, and finesse. Compounded with the blessed profound.